All right. Um. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining our ASA um Australia Asia and Taiwan Study Association sem seminar today. Um. I'm the the president of uh, ASA. Dr. Nen Chang, I'm probably one of the ones who are now really qualified to, 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 to be to be here to chair this section. So I'll, I'll, I'll pass the chair uh responsibility to to Phyllis Leila. But just a quickly uh quickly introduce what ASA is doing and um do a acknowledge to, to the country. So before I start, I'll definitely I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owner of the land we were logging on from. Mine is a uh, Wurundjera. Um, if you are coming from Australia or New Zealand, feel free to type type uh in the chat uh of uh the uh originals um uh, the the land of the original uh, the land of the tr the traditional owner where you're from, as well, and uh I would like to pay respect to the um elders past present and emerging and if uh, we have any originals or indigenous people here, I would like to acknowledge um your presence and thank you for for joining us. Um, like what I just mentioned, um, ASA is a um non-government organization established in two thousand and twenty under the um uh, uh support of uh late um Professor Bruce Jacobs, and what we're doing here is trying to promote um uh, Taiwan studies and Taiwan cultures in in Australia, and we want to expand it to New Zealand and other Pacific Islands as well. You'll probably know that we got um uh Taiwan Taiwan studies in in Europe eats we got um in 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 uh the US but ASA is one of the very first one that has been set up um in the southern atmosphere and what we do uh if you if you're in Melbourne I will definitely want to welcome you to our um second um. Taiwanese film uh, Taiwan film festival in Melbourne which will happen in uh in May on 11th to 13th of uh, May. And what we do here is we try to promote Taiwanese culture through a um, free event. We're organizing this event uh, under support of local um, organizations as well as um, we're, we're working together with uh, Australia, Austra Australian Center of Moving Images, if I get the name right, ACME. So it's one of the very first um, Taiwanese group to are uh, working with Australian government to 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 run this film festival. But of course, today the most important thing is that we have the book launched by, uh, edited by uh, uh, Jarong and uh, Professor Fan. So um, I'll pass the microphone to our chair today, Phyllis, Dr. Phyllis Huang, and she will be uh, chairing this section. Okay, uh, good evening uh, from Australia. I'm Phyllis Yiting Huang. I'm Secretary General of Austro-Asian Taiwan Studies Association in Australia. Today, we are very excited to hold a book launch for this, this fantastic book, Taiwan Literature in the 21st Century, edited by Professor Fan Mingru and Professor Wu Jiarong. And especially Jiarong is in New Zealand and uh, uh, it is powerful. Part of our responsibility to promote <laughs> books published by uh, scholars in Australia and New Zealand. So um, Jia Rong is an associate professor in the Department of Global, Culture and Language Studies at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. And Professor Fan Mingru is a distinguished professor of Graduate Institute of Taiwanese Literature at the National Zhengzhi University in Taiwan. If you are in the field of Taiwan studies, you must know Professor Fan. Yeah, she wrote a lot of works in Chinese and in English. So, uh, and several contributors of the book are also with us today. So they will, uh, Jia Rong and Professor Fan will uh, introduce a bit about this book and then um, other contributors will uh, talk about their chapters. So we have Professor Gunnell uh, Gaffrick today and we have Dr. Li Wenqi, we have Professor Lin Pei Ying, we have Professor Ermin Schweiger, and we have Professor Wu Jiarong and uh, uh, Fan Mingru, of course. So um, before we start the talk, 
Uh, I'll do some uh, housekeeping thing first. So to, for today's book launch, we'll have our editor and contributors to talk about their words. And how we format today's book launch is that we will leave the uh, last part of the talk as Q&A time. So if audiences have any kind of questions, you can either type in the chat column or you can wait until the end and raise your hand. We will let you ask a question directly. So yes, for today's um, book launch, we hope that we have more interactions with the authors since it is a very rare chance for us to gather all the authors from different countries to talk to uh, our audience about this book. So uh, when the audit, uh, when the uh, presenters are talking, please mute yourself so that we can hear more clearly about um, the presentation. And uh, so first of all, we would like to invite the two editors to talk about the general ideas about uh, of this book and the motive of uh, how they why they want to publish this book. Okay, so I'll pass the time first to Jarrell. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, I will share my screen first. Uh, can everyone see the share screen all right? Yes? Okay. Well, good evening from New Zealand. Uh, well, uh, thanks, Felix, for the introduction. This is Jarong uh, from New Zealand, uh, uh, University of Canterbury. Uh, Professor Ming Ru Fan uh, and I uh, very much appreciate uh, the recognition of the edited volume from the uh, Australasian Taiwan Studies Association ATSA. Uh, and thank you, Professor Lennon Zhang and, and Dr. <laughs> Felix uh, Yuting Huang uh, for hosting the book launch of Taiwan literature in the 21st century, a critical reader, uh, which was published by Springer earlier this year. Uh, it is a pleasure for uh, today's speakers, uh, including myself, uh, to spend time with you uh, introducing the book uh, and our research to the online audience. The publication of the book Taiwan Literature in the 21st Century is an outcome uh, of collaboration and teamwork. This volume uh, contains uh, 16 chapters uh, focusing on individual writers and uh, literary and cultural trends of Taiwan. Uh, it is a pity that not all of the contributors can join the book launch. Uh, today, we only have six speakers, uh, including uh, distinguished Professor uh, Fan Ming Ru uh, from National Central University, uh, Professor Gwenelle Gaffrick uh, of uh, University uh, John Mullen Leon Tua, uh, Lee, uh, Dr. Li Wenqi from the University of Edinburgh, um, uh, Professor Lin Peying of the University of Hong Kong, uh, Professor Ermi Swagger of Stockholm University, and finally myself. Uh, we all contributed uh, single authored uh, chapters to the volume uh, due to a time limit. Uh, I will give the introduction only uh, while the other speakers will give a 10 minute uh, presentation each. Uh, we will welcome uh, comments and questions after our presentations. Professor Fan and I are thankful to a number of people and organizations uh, along the way. Uh, the list includes uh, Springer's uh, editorial team and production team. We are highly indebted uh, to the book series editors, uh, Professor Shu Shi of UCLA and uh, uh, Professor Nikki Lin uh, of National Taiwan Normal University. Our home institutions, uh, the University of Canterbury and National Zhengzhou University, uh, also provided uh, substantial uh, support uh, towards the publication of the book. Special thanks go to two external sponsors, uh, the Jiang Jingguo Foundation for Scholarly uh, International Scholarly Exchange uh, and the National Taiwan Normal University. Finally, uh, we feel lucky to have quality contributions from our fellow scholars around the world. And personally, I would like to express my great appreciation of uh, Professor Fan, who worked closely with me throughout the entire journey. Uh, her ex expertise was of great value uh, to our book publication. To be honest, I should be the one to blame uh, if there's any misstep, if there's any problem in terms of editing. <laughs> is my confession to make. Um, so this edited volume, uh, Taiwan Literature in the 21st Century, 
uh, is the fifth publication of Springer's new book series uh, called uh, Sinophone and Taiwan Studies. As you can see here, uh, this book series has covered different aspects of Taiwan literature, uh, Taiwan studies actually, uh, including uh, environmentalism, uh, indigenous study, and even pop culture. Uh, although we adopted uh, a literary approach, uh, our collection clearly addresses similar issues and uh, concerns as highlighted in previous uh, publications of the book series. Uh, next, I'm going to read uh, several excerpts uh, from the introduction to help you better understand the shared goal of the edited book. Our collection aims to explore the multi-ethnic and multilingual way of rewriting Taiwan through a close investigation of both the seasoned and rising writers in the 21st century. Despite its focus on the new styles and topics in literary writing, this volume recognizes the historical and cultural significance of the previous century, which provides a solid foundation for Taiwan literature in the new era. While redefining traditions and norms, Taiwanese writers lead readers to closely examine issues of the past, the present, and the future, such as uh, economic issues, uh, gender equality, uh, 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 ecological conservation, and transitional justice. Other key topics include how literature speaks to society and how Taiwan can be seen by the world in the new era that stimulates the rapid interflow of technology and the large uh, scale transformation of literary communication in the international network. On one level, the scope of Taiwan literature in the last century was widened through the internalization and localization of the artistic methods drawn from Japan, China, and world literature across generations. This cross-cultural approach has been kept alive, enhanced, and even transmuted by the younger generation of Taiwanese writers to generate a new model of, of aesthetics in the past two decades. On another level, a number of groundbreaking writers who established their reputation in the previous century are not absent in contemporary academia, while instilling uh, in their literary works different local elements and sharpening their aesthetic visions in the new age of Taiwan literature. Uh, so, to document uh, the evolving trends of Taiwan literature, we focus on five interconnected parts in the volume. So there, will, there are actually overlaps across sections. The first part of the volume uh, spotlights the re reconstruction uh, of history and politics in Taiwan literature, uh, covering writers like Lai Xiangyin, uh, Li Ang, and Gan Yaoming. The second part comprises three chapters that share a common relevance uh, and interest in the further exploration of genres, forms, uh, and ideas uh, in Taiwan's literary production. Uh, the list includes Wang Wenxin, uh, Xia Yu, and Yi Ge Yan. The third part reflects upon gender and sexuality by examining literary works by Chen Xue, uh, Zhang Yixuan, and Li Gulab Awu. The fourth part tackles topics uh, such as ethnicities and races that occupy an important role uh, in the entire collection. The selected writers are Xiaoman Lan Bo An, uh, Wu Ming Yi, Li Yongping, and Huang Chongkai. Uh, the fifth and the final part of the volume focuses on Taiwan literature in the age of globalization through a critical analysis of Kevin Chen, uh, Chen Sihong, Xiaona Yang Ryan, uh, Yang Xiaona, and Li Kotomi, uh, Li Qingfeng. From this point onward, we have five chapter presentation to give uh, at the book launch today. Um, so uh, my fellow uh, uh, speakers will be talking about Lai Xiangyin, Wu Mingyi, uh, Yi Ge Yan, uh, Chen Sihong, and Shana Yang Ryan. Uh, okay, I'll stop here. Uh, Professor Fan, do you want to add any notes or comments? Uh, you can start when ready. Thank you. I'll stop yeah. sharing. Okay, uh, thanks Professor Wu uh, and hello. Uh... Good day to everyone. Um, my name is Ming Yu Fan uh, from Taiwan. Uh, first of all, I have to thank uh, Asa for the invitation, uh, giving me the opportunity to introduce this book and to meet uh, some of our team members for the first time. Uh, when Professor Wu suggested to me uh, the editing concept of this book, I felt it 
was very meaningful and urgent. Uh, as we mentioned in the book uh, introduction, most English readers' understanding of Taiwanese uh, writer was from uh, before uh, 1990s, and most study uh, were written uh, by scholar in the United States, where basically many uh, textbook are still uh, the same textbook that I read back to my college years. So, um, well, those are classic writer and research paper indeed, but uh, we all know that uh, after the 1990, uh, Taiwan had uh, under, undergone tremendous change and the young generation of writer uh, had also continued to emerge and the form and the theme of the writing are also quite different from the old time. So we, uh, Professor Wen, I quickly decide uh, we will focus on the writer of the 21st century. And in this book, uh, we not only uh, want to negotiate uh, the so-called boundary, uh, the boundary of so-called Taiwanese literature. Uh, we also want to bring up dialogue uh, among scholars of this field uh, from different country and with different academic approach. So we uh, really appreciate uh, the willingness of scholars from various continents to join us and, and submit paper in time. Uh, so I have to take this chance to thank, uh, to thank Professor Wu. Uh, he's the one who uh, really did most of the heavy job. But my special thanks uh, to uh, all of our team member. Without your excellent work, the idea of this book um, could not be realized. So um, when the online uh, and the team were roughly formed, then I thought uh, for foreign reader, if they want to understand uh, contemporary Taiwanese literature, what kind of knowledge base uh, Hello? Sorry, continue. Someone forget to mute. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, for foreign reader, uh, when they want to understand contemporary Taiwan literature, what kind of knowledge base about Taiwan do they need to know? I think that our political and social background after the lifting of martial law should be indispensable. So thinking of this, I immediately knew that I had to introduce Lai Xiangyin's collection of short story, The Translator. Because today, uh, Taiwan is often held as one of the most successful transition from authoritarianism uh, to democracy, often uh, ranking among the top Asia country for indicator of emphasis on uh, freedom and human rights. Indeed, uh, this is our goal and we continue to work on it. But the process of trans transformation is actually very difficult. Uh, progressive force and conservative force are constantly fighting. Therefore, uh, the conservative are disappointed and the idealists are also frustrated. So as, as a result, everyone in Taiwan is not satisfactory. Uh, I think the situation uh, is still entangled in Taiwan society. Lai Xiangyin's translator is the best political fiction that in my, in my viewpoint, which Taiwan reform movement in the past three uh, decades in a very systematic way. It is a process of uh, up and down, uh, hope and lost and recovery after defeat. So I think this novel uh, can not only provide a background for foreigner to read other writer in this book, but also help them uh, understand the recent news or report uh, about many contradictory discourse in Taiwan. Uh, as a writer, uh, Lai Xiangyin started her career in fiction Almost the same year, martial law was lifted. 
She is a very representative writer who had published six novels by now and won many uh, literary prizes. She had been supporting the political reform in Taiwan. Her collection of short stories always contain one or two pieces that touch upon an important event in uh, political uh, progress. In the year of 2017, Lies that seven of her previous work and find new uh, creative uh, fiction into a collection entitled The Translator to celebrate the three decades of democratic movement. Although she is a supporter, Lai Xiangyin refused to make hero of the opposition movement and student movement in order to detotalize, she always emphasized on the diversity and internal schism of the movement, those humanizing his member. The result is that Lai Xiangyin unmasked the reality of the struggle toward democracy. Uh, the writer's belief is also revealed in her arrangement of this novel. Each of the 12 fiction in the translator take place on date critical to political translation. The story are listed in a chronological order and divide it into four categories, except for the last piece. The first two series contrast one another. The first category deals with the emerging force uh, that uh, make the progress. And the second uh, draw on the frustration and setback of the reform. The third category changed his perspective uh, from different ge geographical angles. Uh, the background of the story uh, shifted to Tainan, an uh, ancient city in South, in order to observe the mainstream political uh, trend from the Southerners' viewpoint. The fourth category uh, offered a mental narrative to Lai Xiangyin's own fiction, as well as a uh, historiographic to our time. So my paper, uh, Democracy Detour and uh, Narrator Detached in the Political Fiction, aim to expose uh, the various layer and writing strategy uh, Lai Xiangyin portrayed in her observation on Taiwan's reform movement, uh, including uh, the history of transition from authoritarianism to uh, democracy, uh, the history and uh, internal conflict of the opposition movement, and how the historical period would look uh, when viewed from a different uh, geographical vantage point. And most importantly, how could literature preserve time and how a novelist can come to represent historical truth would let all be possible. Okay, thank you everyone. That is my introduction. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So uh, next will be uh, Professor uh, Gwenel Gavrit. Yeah, hi everyone. So I have a little, uh, short PowerPoint to share, so I hope that everyone can see it. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. So hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you today. Thanks to uh, Professor Phyllis Huang and John Lennon to, uh, for the invitation. And I also would like to thank uh, Professors Fan Ming Ru and Wu Jia Rong for their editorial work and for having me uh, in this project. So my, my contribution in the book is about the writer Wu Mingyi, uh, born in 1971, um, a major and singular author of the contemporary Taiwanese literary scene. Uh, actually, I don't know to what extent um, everyone here is familiar with uh, Wu Mingyi's work, so I don't want to do the injustice to, of a too general reminder, but maybe just a few words about Wu Mingyi. Uh, he's a multi-art author, so he's also a photographer and illustrator, as we can see in the for the cover of his next novel to be uh, published in July. 
Um, he also teaches literature and creative fiction at Donghua University in Hualien and is a fervent environmental activist. So Umi began his literary career writing stories in the so-called nature writing genre, in Chinese, but has also written uh, short stories and novels about Taiwan's history from original perspectives, including the place of non-humans in human event history. So here you have his next novel, which is also about this, uh, these topics. Uh, from an academic point of view, uh, Umi has been the subject of many studies in recent years, uh, notably around his eco-poetics, and especially focusing on a novel considered uh, one of the world classics of climate fiction, which is uh, The Man with the Compound Eyes. And here you have the, the new cover of the Chinese version. So it's a book published in uh, 2011. A story that takes place on the east coast of Taiwan at a time when a huge vortex of waste um, is hitting the coastline. So I, I should point out here that there are actually two ubiquitous literary topos, I mean literary places, spaces in women's work, both of which uh, may seem opposite. First, the city of Taipei, and in particular, the Zhonghua market, Zhonghua Shangchang, which between the 70s and 90s in Taiwan was one of the highest symbols of the Taiwanese economic miracle, and in which Wu Mingyi himself uh, spent his childhood. And secondly, the east coast of Taiwan in Hualien County, between the sea and the mountains, where Wu Mingyi currently teaches and where he runs a small organic farm. So in my contribution to the book, I am interested in these two places and the way in which it brings together human history and environmental history. And in particular, um, um, during what I call continued catastrophes like war or ocean pollution. But I try to do in my, in my contributions to a slightly more original angle, the question of migrations. So first in this chapter, I focus on the migrants of yesterday, both human and non-human. And for this, I study mainly three novels or a collection of short stories and two novels, uh, Roots of Sleep or Roots of Dream. I forgot how it's translated into English. Uh, but also The Stolen Bicycle, and The Illusionist on the Skywalk, as well as, as, well as sort of or other uh, st short stories. In, in this text, uh, Umi tells numerous stories about migrants who joined the Zhonghua market, whatever their place of origin. So be they indigenous, uh, native people, uh, native Taiwanese, mainlanders, Weishanren, and whatever the reasons that push them to come. So the diversity of these migratory trajectories are often put into perspective as much in these novels, actually, that as in other stories is San Wen, for instance, in Chronicles of Lost Butterflies, uh, with the migration of other species living in Taiwan, and in particular, butterflies. So I argue in this uh, chapter that Umi continually emphasizes the importance of Taiwan as a place of confluence, bringing together the migratory trajectories and destinies of living beings in the history of the island. For, for Wu, the environmental history of the island is one in perpetual motion, whether this dynamic is natural or constrained by human action, such as colonization and war, and maybe Anthropocene as well. What is also at the, at the heart of Umi's Salmon collection is the participation of these migrating species whether they stay in Taiwan or return, in the change of its ecosystem. And uh, we have a lot of different metaphors between the migration of human and different species and the way they change and they adapt and they are adapting to the ecosystem. And then I propose a study on the migrants of tomorrow. And in particular, it was the man with the compound eyes uh, through an analysis of the climate refugees 
who gather on the east coast of Taiwan after uh, this environmental disaster. So these characters are again drawn from several ethnic and linguistic communities, Han people, farmers and indigenous, but also Europeans and inhabitants of an imaginary island in Micronesia, uh, Waiwayo in the north. So Umi is interested in how the environmental crisis as a catastrophe implies the foundation of a new politics of coexistence and hospitality in the same place. And then I conclude in, in this chapter by proposing the idea that uh, solidarity of the destinies of living beings migrating in and out of Taiwan gives rise to the hope of what I call an archi citizenship that extends an inherent conception of citizenship during eras like war or Anthropocene where omnipresent stateliness, refugees or emigration or challenging the order of the world. So by extending itself to non-human beings, um, I argue that whose archi citizenship could be conceived as a trans species citizenship, which cannot be defined by race, nation, culture, or hate age, but by the capacity to participate in, in and build a common world. So I would like just to end this short presentation by, by this sentence by Aldo Leopold, which I do not quote in my chapter, actually, but which is quite indicative of Umini's approach, I, I think. It is an irony of history that the great powers should have discovered the unity of nations at Cairo in 1942. The G's of the world have had that notion for a longer time, and each march they stake their lives, lives on an essential truth. And I guess that it's quite the, the approach in, in Umi's fiction. Thank you. Thank you very much. So from um, Lai Xiangyin to right now Wu Mingyi, from political issue to um, nature and human history, right now we'll move to another topic by Dr. Li Wenqi. It's more about gender, right? No, this is not about gender. <laughs> it's still, still the, about the idea and uh, something here. Yeah. So it's the not yet, not yet. Okay. And, uh, yeah. So Jiang Wen, please just show the slides, please. <laughs> Yes, okay, thank you. And uh, I hope today's talk is not so deep into the uh, article because actually I just want to read uh, what I have read uh, before. So, uh, in okay, the, yeah, so the next slide. So in 2003 and four, a, uh, a young novelist established a society called Novelist Readers to promote new strategies of literary writing to break down the wall between high and low culture, between intellectuals and masses. They cultivated a humorous lifestyle and freely adopted popular forms, such as detective and espionage stories. So during this time, Min Lu, uh, Min Lu Fan revisited the old term Xiang Tu and argued that the literary, literature of the new millennium should be considered Ho Xiang Tu, Ho's native soil. The uh, Xiangtu writers has critic criticized social injustice, problems of industrialization, and American new imperialism in Taiwan. By contrast, the writers of a new millennium were experience, exper experimenting with jewelry and less directly political method, as well as depicting elements of folk religions and urging the vernacular using the vernacular of the villages where they grew up. So, Ike Yanzhen, next slide. <laughs> so, Ike Yanzhen's sci fi fiction uh, stories, however, baffle scholars who have attempted to use the term Ho Xiang Tu framework to discuss his depiction of the contemporary Taiwanese social reality. How can plots set in the far fetched future in New York, New Delhi, Tokyo reflect Taiwan's current situation? How should this work be situated within the evolve, evolve, evolving Taiwanese literary scene or in the history of Taiwan? Can we situate his works in the context of Ho Xiang Tu literature? Okay, next slide. To challenge the binary of cosmopolitan sci-fi versus local realism, I used two thought experiments. 
Shadiness Cat and Laplace Demon as inspiration to bring Egoyan's major work, Ground Zero, Lindy uh, uh, and Dream Devourers, Shi Lan, respectively, into clear focus as prime examples of Ho Xiang Tu. My title, Everything Everywhere All at Once, suggests the exploration of infinite time and borderless space in Egoyan's sci fi world should be read as a metaphor for one small concentrated point of intersection between globalization and localism, which is the island of Taiwan. Okay, next slide. So the first one is Lindidian, Ground Zero and Shelingan's Cat. The concept of Shelingan's Cat can clarify how eager yet in Ground Zero's imagines and events that may not happen. The story is set actually in 2017, only five years after it was written, and envisions a nuclear catastrophe at the Longman nuclear power plant, known as the fourth nuclear power plant, Hershey. For him, Taiwan, like Shirley's cat, it contains equal, uh, equal possibility of full experiment, experiments, experiencing, or experiencing, postponing, safely avoiding a radioactive disaster. In the worst scenario, Eager yet imagines the disaster occurring in 2015. In our real world, they has choose another possibility. So it's like a Chelingan's cat. Well, actually, we are very lucky in a way. Choose another possibility. The critical history moment had that changed the fate of Taiwan was the 2014 Sunblock Movement. In 2016, Tsai Ing-wen led the DPP to victory in both the presidential and parliamentary elections. Since the DPP intends to phase out all nuclear power by 2025, construction of the Longman plant will surely not be restarted, and all the plants will be retired. It is as if, in Schrodinger's experiment, the radioactive substance does not, de does not decay and release, release the cat, the gas, sorry, release the gas to kill the cat. It seems that we now live in a better world, a version of Egoyan's world. Egoyan states that Ground Zero was not written for the future, but for the past. Nuclear energy, he says, is a symbol of oppression and exploitation. Egoyan Zen, they use his Shelling's cat as a metaphor for Taiwan's destiny. Next slide. So he says, if the future of Taiwan is like sharing this cat in a box, I think before a real catastrophe comes, Taiwan is now neither dead or alive, as well as both dead and alive. Before the arrival of terrible catastrophe, Taiwan has not collapsed into one definite result. We still have chances. Okay, next slide. So Iga Yan seems to suggest that there are multiple possibilities for Taiwan in the future. Taiwan is a young nation that has only recently shaken off the outdated la label of free China and begun to force, forge its own democratic identity. In resolving issues such as a nation auto autonomy, social justice, environmental protection, and threat from mainland China, Taiwan must be careful in every choice it makes, so it can have the best version of the future. A wrong decision, policy, admiration, administration, or pro-China president could easily cause Taiwan to collapse into an undesirable outcome. So this is the first conclusion for its ground zero. The next one uh, is the next slide, Dream Devour and Lapland's Demon. A Laplace demo is a thought experiment. For such an intent, uh, for such an intent, nothing could be uncertain and future, just like the past would be present before its eyes. So, if this thought experiment is approved, the future can be predictable by anyone, including a well-informed sci-fi reader. This is why I think the futuristic scene could be comprehended by normal ordinary people and even for them address a sim similar problems that transcends the limitation of time and space. 
Next slide. So in these stories, it's a kind of a world, uh, it's a world of cyborg and Andrews, maybe uh, one of the possibilities predicted by Laplace's demon. So I read K, this is who is the hero in this in this story, and he is an android. So K's travel, he's trying to find out who, why he's an android and try to find his identity. And finally, he noticed that he's just an android. At the beginning, he was thinking he's a human. At the big, well, at the beginning, he already know his android, but in the end, he just realized that he just in intentionally being except the false image identity or like false in, in a fantasy or imagination. So I read case travel as in part an allegory of post-colonial political Taiwanese identity. During the long KMT dictatorship, the Taiwanese people like eager yes androids with their uh, with their program streams were incepted with an artificial identity that dismissed, dismissed local and indigenous Taiwanese culture as inferior and barbarous. The Android Liberation, Liberation Organization, which is in the story, is called Android Liberation Organization, in Dreams Devourers, can be hence interpreted as a metaphor for the Dan Wai. Uh, resistance movement, which like eager yes fiction. So the ALO Android Liberation Organization embrace liberation and equality and rebel against an authoritarian regime. They wanted to marginalize and even exterminate it. The KMT, like the Seven Seal in Dream Devourers, which is all the regimes in the Dream Devourers, Seven is called Seven Seal, Di Chi Bong Yin took a hard line on any dissidents, but it is repressive action such as the Formosa incidents in, in the massacre of the Lin, uh, Lin family, the initial stories, and the death of Chen Wenchai in 1981, together with the movement's agitation such as the self-immolation of Zheng Nanlong in 1989 and the white Lily movement of 1990s combined to increasingly deconstruct the KMT authority. With the event, eventual triumph of democracy in the 1990s, the young generation are free to form Taiwanese identity based on their own experience. So next slide. K as a double agent works for both a uh, seven seal, which is the authority and the Android uh, ARO. And his situation can be read as a demo demonstrate, demonstrating the potential of mimicry and ambivalence in Pomi Baba's post-colonial sen sense. K, hey, the hero's double identity, reflects only the Taiwanese people during the dictatorship found themselves caught between the KMT's enforced Chinese-ness and their innate sense of, of difference. Usually, K should have no emotion because he's an android and should not be able to fall in love. Uh, fall in love, yes. Uh, but the ambivalence of androids occur when another android, which he encounters significantly named Eros, which means love, shows her human-like creativity in painting. So you can say kind of binaries just being trans, uh, transcend or transgressed. Just as the Taiwanese people have to learn to forget their supposed inferior origins to be have to speak like the Chinese, so the androids in Dream Devourers seem to evolve into humans by developing human-like affection and imagination. As with Homi Baba's post-colonial dictum, almost the same, but not quite, their behaviors are absolutely from their own inceptive program, yet bear some resemblance to those of Homo sapiens. So next slide. Cassandra, which is the actually who create uh, the K, the age, the, the human android. So he's considered kind of a, in the end, you can see like a big boss in the in the in the story. Cassandra intends to use K, this android, to create the third kind of humans, not design the lay, which is called design the or something, not to uh, conquer the existing Homo sapiens, but to transcend the difference between androids and humans and end the long-standing conflicts peacefully between the human human beings and androids. This aspiration for a new, more complex being is analogous to Li Denghui's effort that has been made to resolve the enduring conflict between Taiwanese islanders and Chinese mainlanders. In 1998, then, pre the, then President Li Denghui uh, delivered a speech to promote the concept of new Taiwanese people, Xin Taiwan Lam. So he says, uh, 
uh, all of us who grow and live on this soul today are Taiwanese people. We all should share a common responsibility for Taiwan's future. It is not a non-transferable duty for all of us, for each of one us of us, the new Taiwanese people, to convert our love and affection for Taiwan into a concrete action in order to open up the grander horizon for its development. So this, so uh, Li Denghui's vision of new Taiwanese people aims to transcend the old division between Taiwanese islanders and Chinese mainlanders by celebrating the multicultural and multilingual vitality of the island and encompassing all its inhabitants, regardless of religions, or ethnicities, or date of arrivals. The meaning of Taiwanese people has evolved through, for example, the inter intermarriage, intermarriage that have been common since 1949, and a small descendants of Chinese mainlanders began to identify themselves with Taiwan. This is very similar to Ika Ye's description of the human agent, for example, like uh, in the in the story, there's a human agent called Gerda, uh, who betrays the Seven Seal, joined the ARO, and even fall in love with the android Eros. So you see a kind of a love between the human beings and also the androids. If transracial love can be possible, it can be hard to define who is android and who is not. So you could think about like in this story, uh, Ika maybe try to tell you like who is Taiwanese, who is not. Actually, it's not quite who is Chinese or who is not Chinese or who is Taiwanese, who is not Chi Taiwanese, is already slowly starting to get blurred, blurred in Taiwan. So my conclusion here in next slide is that Igayan's two sci-fi novels uh, not only reflect global fears of nuclear disaster and more distant worries about future android human conflicts or the consequence of transhumanism, but also allegorize some specifically Taiwanese regional concerns. His exploration, exploration, uh, exploration of future, futuristic literary cosmos does not suggest he is ignorant about the thick history of Taiwan, but has inherited the local concerns of the 1970s Xiangtu writers. His sci-fi writing has not only broken the borders between balanced later, letters and popular fictions, but also convey what is urgent for Taiwanese people to amend. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for Dr. Li Wenqi. Very fantastic presentation <laughs> about the, 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 um, how the uh, sci-fi novel can reflect the political situation in Taiwan. And mm -hmm. uh, right now we are going to uh, two chapters about the globalization of Taiwan literature. So now we will pass the time to Professor Lin Pei Ying. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lennon and Phyllis, for organizing this. And then thank you, Jiarong and Professor Fan, for making this book project possible. I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, so my chapter examines uh, Chen Si Hong or Kevin Chan's portrayal of home and abroad in his so-called uh, Xia Ru San Bu Chi Summer Trilogy that includes a, 19, a 2019 novel called uh, Gui Di Fang Goes Tang, which is a quasi-autobiographical family saga, and a 2020 novel called uh, Florida, Bianxingji, Florida Metamorphosis. And the final one is released in 2020 entitled The Good People Upstairs. So basically my chapter discusses uh, all the three books uh, with the focus on the sort of a recurrent theme of escape and return, um, especially the ghostly, ghostly representation of home and abroad in the summer trilogy. Well, the ghostly town, I'm sure uh, Professor Wu Jiarong is an expert on this ghost town discourse, especially related to Taiwan. So I will not talk too much about that. Uh, so I would like to focus on basically the representation of uh, Kevin Chen about his hometown Yongjing in this um, sort of quasi autobiographical novel, Gui Di Fang. Uh, so um, basically uh, the hometown Yongjing, 
is depicted as a ghost town with the M in order to highlight the violence and trauma experienced by the protagonist Chen Tianhong, which is very similar to Chen Sihong, the author's real name. So it, you can see some sort of projection about the author onto this protagonist. And again, uh, like uh, Chen Sihong himself, this protagonist Chen Tianhong is also the youngest child in the whole family and also both of them come from the extremely big family, either five or six people. Uh, in Chen Sihong, uh, he's actually the ninth, the youngest child of the whole uh, big family. He had seven elder sister and one elder brother. So it's quite amazing nowadays. <laughs> okay, uh, then so uh, Chen explained that the Chen Sihong is Blame that the ghost actually has several layers of meaning. It refers to the time lag of a small town, like uh, his own birthplace, Yongjing. But it can also refer to haunted political memories, such as Taiwan's white terror or KMT's authoritarianism. And the novel opens with Chen Tianhong's German partner, T, asking him about his hometown and family in Taiwan. However, this is a very difficult question for Tianhong, who self-identified as a broken man, which is a huai diao de. This is the recurrent image throughout uh, the book and also other two novels. And so basically, uh, to narrate Tianhong's agonizing past in Yongjing, Kevin Chen, Chen Sihong, chooses the ghost festival as the backdrop of, uh, for his protagonist to start his recollection. As his sisters have asked him to return home after the passing of their father. The story re revolves around Tian Hong's family members, and each of them has his or her, her own problems. The eldest daughter, uh, Su Mei, is trapped in a marriage with a financially unstable husband. The second daughter, uh, Shu Li, is a petty civil servant whose life is just very boring and predictable. And the well-educated third daughter, uh, Su Jing, is despised and sometimes even abused by her hypocritical news anchor husband. The fourth daughter, Su Jie, is troubled by the suicide of her revenge-seeking younger sister and love rival Xiao Mei, who, whom her husband initially dated and intended to marry to the extent that she confines herself um, to her ultra-luxurious mansion is actually quite ironically called White House. So there's some sort of a hint of the American colonial existence in Taiwan here. Uh, so uh, sons are preferred over daughters in the Chen family. This is very similar to the real life of Chen Sihong had experienced and also what happens to the fictional characters in this novel. None of the daughters have had the opportunity to lead a good life. Ironically, the two sons also fail to meet the parents' expectations. The older son in the novel is imprisoned for corruption, while the younger son, Chen Tianhong himself, is incarcerated for the homicide of T in Berlin. And their mother, A Chan, who is uh, illiterate, also had an affair with a resourceful neighbor nicknamed Snake Catcher. So you can see like uh, all the family member have some sort of uh, unspoken past or sort of secret and everybody seems to have a very unideal life. And uh, although Yongjing is a place people wish to escape, they continue to be haunted by their Yongjing memories. And Chen in the novel uses a lot of like natural odors such as animals and rain, different smells in order to evoke the past. But due to the time limit, I will not go into the details. Um, and the members of the Chen family are unable to express love for each other and desire is often suppressed or even distorted. For example, uh, Tianhong's mother views Tianhong's budding desire for another boy as abnormal. And also uh, this boy, <laughs> Tianhong's lover's mother also scolds Tianhong. So basically you have this sort of very um, heterosexual uh, mother who kind of uh, scolds their son's sort of uh, homosexual behavior. So in this novel, home is not a place of solace and the homebound journey is just full of pain. On reaching home in Yongjing, Chen's 
Tian Hong actually feel very model headed and the piercing pain that resemble the snake bike. He feels very suffocated there. And basically, um, he also couldn't identify himself very well in Berlin as he is not welcomed by his parents in Germany who are also quite homophobic. So, and also T is eventually dragged into a pro-Nazism Nazism group thus linking trans homosexuality with social historical trauma. But this is talking about the European social historical trauma. And generally, um, I dis also discussed the woman's role in this novel, Ghost Town. They generally, women bear more pain than men. But in some cases, like uh, Tian Hong's mom, she had a very sort of strong agency because uh, she is the woman who reported Tian Hong's father's uh, homosexual behavior as well. And in the novel, uh, Tian Hong's father um, basically organized a secret uh, left wing sort or left leaning uh, book discussion meeting. So basically uh, in this novel, uh, the theme of homosexuality is very closely intertwined with uh, this sort of um, TMT's repressive um, past during the white terror era. And the person who actually appears as the ghost is the, the father. Uh, and through the father, uh, there seemed to be some sort of uh, father and son reconciliation. Uh, obviously, both of them are homosexual. So I, I found this aspect quite interesting. So it's almost like uh, the mother figure is actually quite uh, homophobic. So I thought that's something quite unique. And the second part of my paper, I basically discussed the second book of this trilogy, which is called uh, Florida Metamorphosis. And basically I talk about uh, the theme becomes repeated um, in this novel as well. So it's about the suffocating hometown. And but this time the protagonist uh, is a group of um, sort of teenage boys and girl, and they were from ultra rich, very, very privileged family. And they basically uh, are sent abroad to Florida. So uh, like the first novel, you have Yongjing versus Berlin. In this one, you also have Taipei versus uh, Florida, especially Miami. And again, um, those kids, although they are so privileged, they couldn't really uh, find warmth or love within their original family. And they are basically controlled by some sort of foundation. Uh, it's actually relate, related to religion, like a jing tu zong. So it's like, a, uh, this is called some sort of lotus observing foundation <laughs> in Taipei. And so basically um, this, Founder is a female who is actually uh, intersex. So again, you can see uh, Kevin Chen tries to tackle this kind of uh, sexuality issue. And then he again sort of uh, intertwine this with uh, Taiwan's uh, kind of uh, early post-war, very traumatic uh, social historical past. And then this is also quite autobiographic because uh, those very privileged kids, they were all born in the same year as Chen Sihong himself which is 1972. This is a very popular year of the dragon. So you can really see he tried to um, demythify this sort of a very sweet image of home. It's just totally uh, quite traumatic and full of like violence or abuse or things like that. And once again, um, you have this sort of a translocal setting, but in this novel, um, I think uh, America originally seemed to be very, very free and bold, almost like a sort of a nice place to escape, but actually it didn't quite work out. It's actually also bring them a lot of uh, remorse and trauma as well. So again, you can see the protagonists, they try to find some sort of reliable identity either at home or abroad, but again, they fail in both locales. And so the third part uh, I discuss is uh, the last book of this trilogy. It's called uh, The Good People Upstairs. And so again, this uh, novel rotates between uh, two locales, like this time it's Berlin and Yuanlin in Zhanghua. And home again is the place from which the protagonist yearns to escape, but again in vain. And the novel focuses on the eldest daughter growing up in a single parent family. It focuses basically on this daughter, so is, who is a mid-age 
virgin woman, and she basically encountered her first uh, sexual awakening experience in Berlin while visiting her homosexual younger brother. And very interestingly, uh, in this novel, Chen Si Hong again pairs the sexual drive of this female protagonist uh, with this sort of um, mm, homosexual desire because of why the sister speaker had this sexual awakening because uh, she hears some sort of love making sounds from the gay couple next door while she stay in a hotel. So again, you can uh, sense that Chen Si Hong tried to uh, tackle this sort of homosexual desire, but this time uh, she he also tried to look at the often ignored mid-age woman's, single woman's uh, sexual awakening. So uh, in my conclusion, um, I basically uh, argue that uh, the three novels can be seen as a coherent entity revolving around the same thing, which is like escape and return. And again and again, he tried to deal with this sort of homo political oppression. And so I thought this is sort of translocal um, characteristic is one of the very distinct feature of Chen Si Hong's uh, Xiangtu writing, basically, broadly speaking, he's talking about his hometown in Taiwan, although it could be some sort of a through a uh, sort of a temporal span. It's not, perhaps uh, there's a difference between the real Yongjing and the sort of fictionalized Yongjing. And I also point out two other characteristics of his uh, hometown writing, which is uh, his uh, very hipster, Wen Qing style, because uh, uh, if you read his novel, then you basically can tell what sort of music he likes and what sort of novel or novelist he likes. Because, uh, for example, Ernest Hemingway or Carol King's song or things like that. There are a lot of uh, or and then ghost paintings, just a lot of Western cultural icons or references being weaven into his fiction narrative. And the third uh, characteristic uh, is something I already mentioned is basically his continued interest in tackling sexual awakening and homosexuality together and then sort of uh, with the kind of uh, uh, general uh, social political background of Taiwan's sort of early um, white terror era. So uh, I think uh, I will just uh, stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Chen Si Hong's uh, Gui Di Fang, I, I, I read that book before, and I think that he brings uh, gender studies, gender writing into another level of um, um, Xiangtu writing. Yep. So right now we are uh, welcome our last presenter, Professor Ermi Schrager. She will talk about uh, Shona Yang Ryan. Let me, did you all, uh, oh, yep, please unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. All right. So can you hear me and can you see everything? Great. Yeah, first, my thanks goes, of course, to uh, today's host, Professors Lennon Chang and Phyllis Huang, and especially to the editors of the book, Jia Rong Wu and Ming Wu Pan. Thank you very much also for having me. So um, talking about uh, or dealing with American writer, um, Shona Yang Ryan begs, of course, the question: uh, How is her place, uh, or no, how, where is her place in Taiwanese literature or in Taiwan literature, right? And also, uh, how does she, or where does she place herself? So, I'm in my in my article. I provided some bibliographical notes. Uh, Ryan's parents they met in Taiwan during the Vietnam War. Her mother from Taiwan, with family history in China. And her father, obviously uh, American with German ancestors. And the couple left um, Taiwan and settled down in Northern California, where uh, Shona Yang Ryan was born in 1976, what came to be called as a so called second generation Asian American. So, as you can see from this little list, uh, she has several, she has several chops or several well, roles. Uh, author, academic, uh, as well as activist. So her first book is uh, Water Ghosts, uh, apart from the number of short stories and essays. Uh, it was first published as Locke, 1928, and it's a ghost hunting novel that tells the story of the first um, of the first generation Chinese immigrants in the factual town of Locke in 1928. This book is less about China 
uh, it's more about America or it is about America as it seeks to inscribe the trauma, uh, the traumatic memory of the first Chinese immigrants into American national history. So she is taking up the, so those uh, marginalized, marginalized women without past or without stories. And uh, she depicts them not simply as victims, but uh, she's they are given voice, they are given agency in this book. So I would uh, say that Water Ghosts can be read as a feminist counter narrative of or to the nation state. So we will turn to the next book, and this is what is my my article um, focusing on, of course, uh, with the title Green Island. It was published in in uh, Taiwan as well as in America, first in the States in 2016. And here uh, the author embarks on dealing with transnational Taiwanese American history. It spans from the Araba incident uh, to the SARS crisis in 2003. It unfolds across two countries, which is Taiwan and the US, and also it spans across three generations. So the narratives present in the US, looking back to her parents' generation who became victims of the white terror, as well as the narratives children, the third generation born and raised in the US, as well as the future of Taiwan's citizens. Um, so if we compare these two novels, uh, what we can see here is that Water Goes, her first novel, basically deals with local history, which is to say American history while Green Island addresses transnational history. Water Ghosts can be read as a counter narrative to the nation state, and it questions the idea of national identity, while Green Island is a call for an affirmation of the nation state, and it aims at building national identity. So in my article, I argue that um, first, Green Island builds on a number of stories and texts that frame the Araba as what is called impact event, a term I took from Alida Asman. Um, by definition, an impact event is charged with overwhelming monumental emotional energy and certain ideological implications. Second, Green Island itself is an impact narrative as it carries the Araba impact event across the Pacific and across three generations in order to ensure an afterlife of what we can see as a foundational myth of Taiwan, which refers to Araba. So as you could see from the, from the posters I just showed, you know, films and books in English, right? Uh, you can see that this pattern, this Araba uh, pattern, which refers to the 28th of February, 1947, uh, is framed in a certain way, or there are certain patterns you can see. First of all, it represents a national trauma that shattered the material and the symbolic world. Second, it represents forced collective amnesia and cyanocentrism. And third, it represents a history of betrayal and abandonment that deprived Taiwan of its, or that, that deprived Taiwanese of their identity and Taiwan of its international recognition and its place in the world. So reading Green Island, um, I employ concepts of memory studies. So apart from the literary scholar Alida Asman, I refer to French philosopher and sociologist Maurice Halbach's conceptualization, conceptualization of uh, family as a crucial site for the production of memory. And uh, I juxtapose this with Marianne Hirsch's post-memory, which is a concept that is charged with an activist potential. And then you basically do have a different picture when reading the story. So while the author suggests the obvious, I argue otherwise. And my argument is to say that Ryan is not only or less concerned with the idea of working through the after effects of an inherited trauma, nor is she mainly concerned with the question how trauma 
travels from one generation to the next, but her trauma narrative, and it basically is one, uh, Green Island, mainly serves as a vehicle to articulate her ethical and political concerns and her desire to create a trans-Pacific political and cultural space. So what happens in the story is, um, you could say, it's not really three parts, but the gist of Green Island, in my reading, makes use of three entangled narrative, narrative times, three spaces and three stories. So Ryan is telling a brutal, humiliating and traumatic chapter of 20th century history, which is also a story of resistance and a story of reconciliation. And she is also flagging for civic engagement and she's pointing to a future oriented worldview. In her novel, she uses the dynamic of or between the familial and the national, the individual and the collective to actually drive home her message and also to, you know, to let the story move forward. So let's just have a bit of a closer look quickly. So Taiwan, more or less, here you could see when playing out when, when parts of the story, and this is of course not framed one after the other, but when, when playing out in the story or, or in Taiwan, uh, you can see that the national domain invades the familial space and turns life upside down. So it's the family and the individual who are the victims. And uh, in the face of a brutal, however, faceless national perpetrator, which clearly and obviously and outspokenly in the novel refers to the Kuomintang. So it is the nation state that sets the frame and the narration for the individual and the family. So we can read these parts of the story as a memory of victimized individual and the national trauma. Um, so when the story plays out in, in, uh, in the US, or when you could say then the impact event, Araba, is framed as impossible trans-Pacific space. So here the narrator starts out developing and becoming aware of her Taiwanese identity, which is not Chinese. I give you one quote. In America, I had stopped calling myself Chinese and started calling myself Taiwanese. In America, I had met my first Chinese national and discovered the gulf that separated us despite the language we held in common, end of quote. So the moment the narrator starts seeing through the fabric of the Kuomintang propaganda and the US complicity, she starts to actually form a Taiwanese identity and to understand historical truths. And this is also marking a turning point in, in the story. Uh, so now family history starts challenging the national narrative and actually leads to political activism. And this is also the point when this trans-Pacific space emerges as a space where on the one hand, uh, Taiwanese student activism flourishes in a free and democratic environment. In, now I'm talking about the 70s. At the same time, this activism is smashed and endangered by Cold War logic. So in this parts, uh, we would say we do have a, a memory of the victimized nation and of national awakening. So the third, um, space uh, and, and time, uh, the trans-Pacific space, what we can see in Green Island is that familial memories from both sides of the Pacific, Taiwan and in the US, are mapped onto each other. This is to say that um, both histories are affiliated across generations and across geographically separated sites. So we do have uh, both Taiwanese nationalism and American long distance nationalism that are driven by the same impact event and its emotionally charged conceptual patterns. 
So the pursuit of Taiwanese independence and political sovereignty links both sides of the Pacific. This common history, which is uh, in this book uh, told as family history, is basically a, a precondition for and an effect of a national identity and in consequence a transnational identity. So building a future can only be achieved by remembrance, by reconciliation, and by creating a collective common sense at the cost of individual experiences and subjectivities. I give you one quote, a shared experience, a shared history, a shared trauma. This is what made us family, end of quote. So here we do have an activist memory pointing to a future-oriented world. To sum up, um, Ryan's Green Island can and should be read as an ideology-oriented narrative for several reasons. Uh, it not only shows the political concerns and creates historical awareness uh, across the Pacific, but I hope I could show in my in my um, paper uh, that that it also establishes a trans-Pacific space that allows her to renegotiate her own identity. The thematic choice of, if we think back to water ghosts, together with the statements of the author, initially assigned uh, Ryan and her work to the field of Chinese slash Asian American literature. Her chronicling a Taiwan-centric narrative, however, confirmed her conscious shift away from a generalized pan-ethnic Chinese Asian diaspora towards an ethnically and geographically specific assignment within the Asian American bubble. So situating herself in Taiwan enables her to speak back to the US as well as to Taiwan and of course by implication also to China. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for all of our, our presenters. You, your presentations are very concise and very interesting. And especially it's amazing that this, this book includes such a wide variety of topics that cover um, Taiwan's most recent uh, trend of literature. So right now we have around 10 minutes <laughs> to have our audience to ask questions. So I would like to ask our audience, if you have any questions, you can um, either raise your hand or you can type in chat. Any of you want to ask questions? Not yet. If uh, I think I'll give our audience some time to digest all the presentations and I will start the first question. Uh, I personally am very interested in uh, Shona Young Ryan. So I would like to ask um, uh, uh, Ermi as well as our editor, just like what Ermi says about Shona Young Ryan, when I read her uh, a lot of her interviews and also her book, uh, Green Island, what I feel is that I kind of question how we can define her as a Taiwanese writer. I, I, I think I have the, the same feeling as Ermi because um, for her, she says in a lot of interviews saying that when she was young, she didn't have any ideas about Taiwan because her mother is a, was a Melinda from Taiwan and she didn't know much about Taiwan until she got the funds from uh, Taiwan and she lived there, started to do the research about uh, this novel. And it's just like what Ermin says, uh, it's, in this novel, it's like during the period of writing this novel, she gradually recognized her like Taiwanese identity and recognized that the Taiwanese feature is different from Chinese feature. And Based on her statement, she says that originally she wanted to write this book for 
overseas, like Chinese American or Taiwanese American. But I was so surprised in, in early 2016, when I bought this book in English version, I started to, to read it. And uh, when I'm not yet finished reading this, we have the Chinese, the Chinese version published in Taiwan. It's so fast. And this book was so popular in Taiwan. It's like everybody in the field of Taiwan studies talking about this one. And it seems that Shona Young Ryan is the only like Taiwanese America, American whose novels are so popular in Taiwan. So could you please say something about this? Well, I try to make a few points and I think uh, the points you raised could even be made much more stronger. I think uh, her own interviews show very clearly that she is, you know, um, writing this reworking, working through, uh, you know, this, ha this heavy story kind of using <clears throat> uh, this what I call impact event. Uh, so my, my critique, uh, which could even be sharper, I think, than, than the one in, in the article, is basically also, um, I think it's very convenient, of course, to uh, allow for canonization in Taiwan's literary history and uh, participation in the project, what uh, Wang and Roy has called Writing Taiwan. So it's, it's, it fits into it. It's very welcome in Taiwan. Uh, when we discuss Taiwan literature, uh, it, it's a very open field. So there is still, you know, space. <laughs> And, uh, but as I said, I think it's more, uh, less making use of this position, uh, you know, to formulate multi-directional criticism. I really think it's more uh, about um, redefining her own, her own identity. I think that's the main point. And the reason why uh, I first was, you know, reading this book and thought, okay, this is a typical, you know, trauma reworking, working through and how trauma transcends from one generation and so on story. And um, you have many concepts like Haltbox and you know, others uh, talking about individual and collective history. But uh, post-memory, if you use that concept, which is actually a very critical concept, it's not just a concept that uh, you know, talks about memory after memory, so to say, talking about the second generation, but it's also about, you know, uh, in how far or how do you, you know, make use of traumas of others? It's of course a, a, a concept that is developed from Holocaust studies, of course, right? Uh, and you do have the same discussion going on in the field uh, when it comes to other national traumas, so to say. Uh, you know, what is, what is allowed, so to say, and what is not allowed, you know, and how far do you make use of? So, so uh, this is why I showed the first uh, uh, slide also, you know, to showing that she, um, that she makes very clear that she has like this identity of a writer, but also of an activist. And uh, she has, you know, she has a job to do in the US. Uh, to establish herself also. And uh, I think Taiwan, if you put it negatively, you could say is very convenient uh, uh, also for, for her writing. And, uh, but, but I mean, um, yeah, well, there's not much more I could say. I was asking, I was taking her books as a kind of challenge, you know, to actually think through in how far, uh, you know, does she, uh, belong or not belong, this is not the right word, but you know, in how far is she, you know, is, is this Taiwan literature? And you can of course read it as Taiwan literature if you wanted to, it's perfectly okay. Uh, it's not me, it's not my job to decide, but uh, I took it as a challenge to actually think through, you know, what is Taiwan literature and what is Taiwanese literature? What is Taiwan identity? And I just thought it's very interesting because she's arguing completely different in both books, depending on what ends it. Sir, if you could say, if you put it negatively, I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you. So our editors, do you want to say something about how you pick Shonaya Ryan as one chapter of this book? Uh, if I may, I would like to say a few words. Uh, the funny the funny fact is that uh, roughly two years ago, when Fan Lao and I started uh, discussing uh, the potential book uh, structure, uh, 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 we expected uh, to receive a question like that. 
yeah, when we decided to include Shana Ryan <laughs> in the anthology, we uh, we understood the potential threat. <laughs> we understood uh, uh, we have this poor understanding of potential challenge ahead. Um, but still, I think our goal is to expand uh, the scope of Taiwan literature. That's why we have the title, right? Uh, Taiwan literature in the 21st century, because we uh, uh, we are hoping uh, to initiate uh, uh, new debates and, 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 and scholarly exchanges across the globe. And actually, uh, uh, Taiwan literature is centered uh, around uh, uh, Taiwan's political realities, uh, 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 ethnic uh, and, and racial entanglements, um, indig indigenous practices, and, and, and more recently, global networking. As you can see in our uh, presentation today, we uh, Taiwan literature is not just about Taiwan, right? So we have uh, a Pain, uh, Professor Lin Pain talking about uh, a sense of home uh, uh, with a uh, a, 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 a prominent writer with the German background, right? Okay, so we have, we have this two-way traffic between central Taiwan and, and Berlin, Germany. And when she's not just talking about Taiwan, right? So we, we have this fabulous sci-fi world beyond uh, the Taiwanese territory. Uh, Grant also uh, talks about Wu Ming Yi uh, 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 in connection with this uh, trans-Pacific indigenous network. Uh, um, so so I think that's the, that's, that, that's the direction we are heading toward uh, in the 21st century. We just don't want, we just don't think that Taiwan literature should be bound by any singular uh, uh, political ideology or state or, or even by uh, uh, language uh, barriers. Um, we, 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 I think it's our duty to uh, 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 instill new energy <laughs> into the category. At least that's exactly what we have been doing uh, for years now. Uh, Fan Laoshi can definitely uh, give us a, a, a more concrete <laughs> answer to the question here. But I also see the, uh, Ermi's hand up. So maybe Ermi wants to contribute as well. No, no, I just want to switch the topic. Fan Laoshi. Fan Laoshi, do you want to say something about uh, Shunaya Ryan so that Ermi can ask her question after you? Well, well, uh, when we, when Professor Wu and I talk about uh, how many writers uh, should we include, um, we immediately predict um, the question like that because we want to. Uh, I think the the Taiwanese writer uh, what is make different from the. 21st century Taiwanese writer from the old day is because uh, we are enter a era of a global village. So the uh, migration and immigration is so quick and uh, is unstable, not on the old day. So for example, like Professor Wu, now he is teaching in uh, New Zealand. Could, they, could we call it uh, not Taiwanese, right? So, um, Opeyin, is he Chinese right now? Oh. So, I think um, those questions, the definition of Taiwanese uh, would become a question. And we want to want to define it. We just want to brought up um, the debate. Uh, we want to open up a question. Uh, so, like in our category, we want to include uh, those who write, uh, those writers who immigrate to uh, Taiwan or or, uh, or immigrant out of Taiwan. So we include a uh, writer like um, Li Yongping who uh, came to Taiwan. We also want to include someone who moved out to Taiwan, for example, Lai Xiangyin and David and then be changed. And also like um, uh, the writer we did not mention about it is uh, Kodomi Li. Uh, she is a writer who, who grew up in Taiwan, but she moved, she moved to Japan and written in, in Japanese. So, but, but maybe one day she will move back to Taiwan and write her fiction in Chinese again. So I think um, 
the boundary right now is so um, blurred. So um, that's why we think we should uh, open up um, uh, the framework of so-called Taiwanese literature uh, for a further discussion. After all, now it is the debate what is about the, what is what is the boundary of Chinese literature, or should we call it Sinophone literature, right? So why not we make Taiwanese literature as another debate? Okay. So, Thank you very much for your answer. So, uh, Erwin, do you want to ask your question? Well, if no one else ask a question, I will of course uh, make use. Okay, of the yeah, please go ahead. Just one sentence to uh, uh, to uh, Shona Young Ryan. I mean, you could as well read her as you know catering to to the appetite of you know a certain group uh, uh, like you know Asian or Taiwanese American. Uh, writers, of course, not writers, I mean, people, right, readers. So, uh, but that's, uh, of course, we had this discussion before when it comes to Chinese reader writers uh, catering to a Western audience when reading, you know, cultural revolution, you know, stories and topics over and over and over again. But anyway, I do actually have a question to you, uh, Wenchi Li, uh, regarding, uh, you know, uh, Ugo Yams. Um, yes. <laughs> Uh, Dream story. devourers. You know, yes. when I when I when I um I haven't read the books, I just read your article in advance. Mm -hmm. And when <laughs> Kim came up, I thought, like, you know, why don't you think of Kafka? Isn't that a ref a clear reference to Kafka? No, I don't think so. But this is a good idea, but I don't think so because K just a cap like K. And no, I would not say this is not referring to Kafka. But what is interesting uh, is about this kind of journey because there's a whole story is about a K who's an agent and he's a he's an android. And he he pretended he was the, his human beings. So he worked for the government because the government just ex, ex marginalized those, those androids and asked those androids to do like labor force or labor work. And so human beings is more superior and then androids is most inferior. So he just pretended he know his android, but he just pretend he's human beings. So, but he just want to know like why he has the kind of memories or like imagination or like fantasies about like uh, that as uh, that, uh, about like uh, androids. So he finally he just like uh, tried to find out uh, his identity, and in the end he just noticed that all the families or all, all the fantasies, all the imagination just uh, incept before uh, by intentionally by Cassandra, and then because she or he actually is a kind of android, just, just a little bit funny. So be, according to like a Greek mythology, actually, obviously it's uh, inspired by the like Greek mythology. So Cassandra, he or she want to create kind of third human beings, which is beyond human beings and also kind of uh, beyond human beings and android. So it's very interesting to see kind of uh, uh, journey a kind of way of searching his own identity just remind me of like a Taiwanese identity like Taiwanese people how to say they could they could search their own identity maybe just from Chinese identity and then slowly, slowly move to Taiwanese identity so this is why I just think about it I don't never think about like even kind of there's a kind of connection between uh Kafka's work or like uh yeah uh eager yen yes this is uh no, I would just say, but maybe you have your ideas. So maybe just give me some inspirations and maybe you can write another article about this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and also when I write these articles, uh, also another issue is uh, when I write these articles is uh, most inspired by Taiwan East, for example, East Taiwan. Uh, I mean, in Europe, usually we just talk about like Taiwan's identity, Taiwan's politics. And I know this is quite kind of trend because you, I know like this book is particularly for very readers who want to understand Taiwanese or taiwanese or Taiwan's identity. So that's with that, I think like uh, Egan's work is quite a good example in a way to explore Taiwanese politics through the sci-fi genre and also Taiwan's uh, identity. And so it's much inspired by Taiwanese or like a uh, Taiwan studies in Europe, rather than what is the like uh, what is has been what much discussed in Taiwan. If you have a chance to go to like Hua Yi, this kind of website, like academic website, to search like uh, local arts with ad academic articles on Yi, usually it's just more mainly discussed about like for example like love, 
but to android or like a love but to android a human beings so or like the concept of love but i think this is not enough to talk about eager yet so i just think like hey maybe let's just think about just change our mind and to think about like hey maybe there's kind of Taiwanese identity or Taiwanese politics in uh, Ikea's work. So this is why I try to argue and try to say, okay, there's quite something really, really related to Taiwanese identity or Taiwanese studies in uh, Ikea's cosmopolitan sci-fi genre or sci-fi works. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because of the limitation of time, but I really want to uh, conclude conclude this um um presentation and book launch and could. I ask all of our presenters to use one sentence to uh, conclude what Taiwan is in the work that you research. Just one sentence will be enough because we are uh, exploring the possibility of Taiwan literature so that it will be good for you to like use one sentence to conclude what, what you did in uh, the book you research and then we will. <laughs> Okay, so um, um, who can <laughs> start? Uh, Professor Fan, would, do, would you like to? Okay, um, I think uh, I'm the one who uh, live and do my research in Taiwan. So I'm the Taiwan center, but I think uh, Taiwan is not only uh, my home. I think it is a linking. Um, to the world, uh, that is that is the same idea that we uh, include all the writer uh, mm -hmm. in our book because I think no matter uh, they live in Taiwan or they are not or live in other place, they are still uh, linking and uh, conversation with Taiwan uh, in certain way. Uh, so do other scholars who are doing Taiwan study in our field. So that is the meaning for me to do a uh, Taiwan study. And I really still have to thank all of you again. Thank for you. For the opportunity. Okay. Thank you. So how about Professor Funnell? Jeffrey? Oh, could you please uh, yeah, make yourself? Uh, actually, I, I'm going to cheat because, uh, you know, as translators and researchers would prefer to give mm -hmm. writers a uh, voice. So I will use like a quotation from Wu Mingyi, which possibly defines Taiwan. So it, it should be much better than I can propose. <laughs> so here, here it is. Uh, it's uh, taken from uh, one of his San Wen, and he has this sentence. Uh, Taiwan is a Taiwan So I think it's much better than everything I could say. Okay, thank you very much. And how about uh, uh, Dr. Li Wenqi? Yes, I think I was just uh, inspired by uh, the Igayan's dream devourers about the conflict between Android and human beings. Also, so it's a conflict between Taiwan, Weizen, and Bensalan. So it's a kind of my wish or my hope that I hope uh, Taiwan, this society could become more multilingual and multicultural and more open to the others, to other people's opinions. Right now, like uh, now, right now, Taiwanese islanders, uh, I mainland is a bit more marginalized in the Kuomintang. So, but still, we need to respect them and respect their opinions right now, still. So, I hope that in the future, Taiwan will become more multicultural and more multilingual and more open to the others and other people's voice and also identities. And also, we have right now, Wai Ji, Xin Yi Min, for example, new immigrants. Yes, this is my hope or my wish. Thank you. Professor Lin Peng. Thank you. Uh, I echoed uh, the quote uh, Gwen Niu just gave, uh, <laughs> which is written by Wu Mingyi. Taiwan indeed is constantly changing. If I just focus on maybe Kevin Chan or Wu Mingyi, I, I feel uh, both sort of um, like uh, mid-age writers, if you are still calling them young-ish writers, uh, they somehow seem to be equally at home dealing with 
very, very local Taiwan specific issues, but at the same time, they seem to have this ability of uh, generating a conversation with global aspects. So either through echoed criticism or through something quite globally uh, relevant issues such as uh, homosexuality or things like that. So, but at the same time, you can always see some sort of Taiwan specific, uh, like a context or reference in their work. So I would say, uh, it is sort of um, interesting uh, tension between this sort of uh, nativism and globalization. I, I don't see them sort of uh, incompatible, but somehow they just seem to be sort of uh, being reconfigured in their work. So uh, I also uh, Shona Young. So I guess maybe if you would think about Taiwan, uh, the literary, then it's a space I think it's sort of expanding. So it's sort of a two-way traffic. So when she already mentioned, uh, like within Taiwan itself, we no longer talk about four major ethnic groups. Uh, there's also a uh, Xin Yiming, and we also have now a uh, Sinophone uh, sort of uh, migrants uh, from Hong Kong and also actually from mainland China as well, although the number is not a lot. So I feel, yeah, just at the same time, people, come and people leave. So I think this will constantly be still being played out in uh, the current 21st century Taiwan literature. Thank you. Uh, so Evie? Well, I think um, it has basically most of it has been mentioned. Like Taiwan is, of course, a kind, a kind of lab. Uh, you know, everything happens at the same time. <laughs> Uh, and we can see the many different layers. We can see uh, the discussions that go wrong and right and so on. Uh, Taiwan, I think, is, uh, is a great place to also develop uh, a kind of um, critical potential, you know, to look uh, not only to China, but also to the world. Uh, at the same time, I still think it's some kind of iron house, uh, like uh, Lu Xun decided, you know, there's no, there's, there's no, real thing or it there's it, it, it's if you say you know it's easy if it's easy if it becomes multicultural if it becomes multi-ethnic and so on you know things are going right I doubt that you know that there is a clear kind of idea what should happen and how the future could look like so I think as especially as academics uh, I think we have to be aware of the fact that uh, you know, it's some kind of uh, impossible site, some kind of impossible construction, and uh, uh, we make things too easy if we think there is a very clear, a very clear way for for Taiwan or or for like for any other country identity and so on and so forth. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So I. I think it is getting late and Professor Wu Jiang well, wants let, to go to sleep. You haven't <laughs> let Jia Rong say. Yeah, so that's what I want to say. I will let Jia Rong to make the huh. last statement to conclude what Taiwan is, Taiwan is, and you can go to sleep. Well, it's indeed getting late. Uh, it's actually my bedtime. <laughs> well, to me, uh, I do Taiwan studies. Uh, I, I'm a proud literary critic of Taiwan literature and film. Um, to me, Taiwan uh, is an invisible island uh, given, yeah, you know, um, yeah, Taiwan is definitely a ghost island, well, in my opinion. Well, <laughs> and it's what I've been doing research on. Um, but I think uh, 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 we are doing meaningful, meaningful things uh, to make Taiwan more visible and more accessible uh, in the English speaking world. Well, I hope. Well, I think I'll stop here. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your fantastic presentation. Thank you for our all audience to stay with us tonight. Thank you very much. So this is the end of the book bunch. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. bye. bye.